that horse. The makers of mobile gas and mobile oil bring you Orson Wells. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. This is Orson Welles, the Mercury Wonder Show, broadcasting tonight from the Air Service Command Training Center at Fresno, California. You know, we've been doing magic shows in the Army camps for more than a year now, so tonight we thought we'd do a few of our tricks for you on the broadcast. I usually open the show with the Indian rope trick, and as my assistant, I usually use Gypsy Rose Lee. <laughs> She's uh, quite a magician herself, you know. You should see her make things disappear. <laughs> but the Indian rope trick, the Indian rope trick is one in which I cause a coiled rope to rise slowly from the floor and to stand on end. Then I have Gypsy Rose Lee climb up the rope and vanish, followed by a serviceman from the audience <laughs> who also uh, climbs up the rope and vanishes. I had to stop doing the trick. <laughs> took me 30 seconds to get him up there and two weeks to get him down. <laughs> so, <laughs> come on down the midway, folks. You're just in time to see the greatest magic show you've ever listened to. Hurry, 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 right this way for the big show, folks. The Mercury Wonder Show for Savers Men. That means you, soldier, if you got your girl with you, bring her in. She'll be amazed, she'll be astounded, she'll be thrilled. There are no lights in the balcony. Oh, the magic show. Let's go in. Oh, nuts to bed, honey. Let's get going. What's your time? Oh, I only got a six-hour pass. The Mercury Wonder Show, folks. It's a 4F joke, you know that. For the magnificent. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I greet you in the words of the mysterious East. Mashallah, inshallah, abacadabra. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> May your shadows never be less. Tonight we're going to attempt to entertain you with a few feats of conjuring, sleight of hand, ledger domain, prestidigitation, and hanky panky. Bring out the tape. Uh, <clears throat> for my next illusion, I shall produce from thin air not a goldfish bowl, not a rabbit, but a beautiful lady. Now watch me very closely. Gavasa, inshallah, mashallah, abacadabra. Sure, 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 sure. <laughs> Nothing happened. Maybe I sang it in the wrong key. Sure, 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 sure. Slide whistle. <laughs> Heavens to Betsy, I hit the jackpot. There are two of them. Gentlemen, I give you a double feature. Two scintillating young stars with one name and one face. That gorgeous parlay from the picture, Andy Hardy's Blonde Trouble, the Wild Twins. Ooh. Hello, girls. Hello. hello, girls. Oh, you said hello. <laughs> Certainly nice to meet you, girls. Face to face to face to face. <laughs> When you girls arrived here this afternoon, there was quite a reaction from the men around the field. It's the first time I ever saw a pilot come in ahead of his plane. <laughs> Which one of you girls is the spokesman for the team? I am. Well, maybe I'd better start out by asking you to identify yourselves. Which is Lynn and which is Lee? She is. <laughs> Well, let me put it this way. If I were to ask Lynn for a date tonight, who'd be waiting for me when I arrived at your house? Our mother. Uh, your mother doesn't... Girls. Girls, doesn't your mom allow you to go out with boyfriends? Oh, she's angry with Lee now because she's... Lee's in love. Lee's in love? Well, love's a perfectly natural thing. I know, but she's in love with an old man. He's 27. 27? <laughs> How old are you, Mr. Wells? <laughs> 29. I'm practically falling apart. <laughs> on the screen, you look much younger. Oh, on the screen, I look much younger. Yes, I saw you in Jane Eyre, and I thought it was wonderful. Oh, really? Thank you. What would your sister Lynn think of it? Oh, she's the intelligent one. <laughs> well, 
as you know, girls, we're in the midst of a magic show. I wonder, how would you two like to assist me in a trick? We'd love to. Fine. Assistant, bring out a box and a saw. Well, what kind of a trick is it, Mr. Will? You'll see. You girls always, uh, work together. Always. Never been parted. Never. Tonight, it's going to be different. <laughs> Oh, by the way, girls, this is my assistant, Ben Alley Hakim Itznik, known locally as the Yodeling Goldbrick. How do you do? How do you do? <laughs> Don't be so formal, girls. Run your fingers through his hair. I said his hair, not his pocket. Are you the Wild Twins or the Summer Sisters? All ready with the equipment, Hakim? Yes, ma'am. Now watch closely, everybody. I'll now saw. I'll now saw two women in half. This, this is known as making a four the hard way. Oh, Mr. Wells. Uh, yes, girls? Uh, instead of doing a trick, why can't we just sing a song? Well, for that you need an orchestra. I merely utter the magic words, Lud. Lud Gluskin and Presto. <laughs> and you shall hear of the summer driving of Mr. Revere. Now, Mr. Revere was a far-sighted man, and Mr. Revere was a mobile oil fan. He said, summer's coming, preparedness pays. I should change the oil for the hot summer days. My car will run better, said he, and what's more, this car's got to last me till after the war. At the sign of the flying red horse, Revere stopped. A habit, my listeners, that you should adopt. The right grade of mobile oil, that's what he got for motoring days that are dusty and hot. Why, Mobile Oil, folks, is the world's favorite brand. For warding off friction and wear, boy, it's grand. 
Yes, Mr. Revere did just right by his car, and all summer long was his car up to par. So, do like Revere. Here's my warning and how. The summer is coming! Get mobile oil now! For my next delusion, I should like the assistance of two members of the audience. Anyone at all you, sir, in the first row? Thank you and you. Thank you very much. We're continuing now with our magical extravaganza. Here we are. What is your name, please? Uh, what's your name, uh, Sergeant? Sergeant, uh, say that again in the microphone, will you, over there, Sergeant? Uh, Sergeant Jimmy McDevitt, technician, fourth grade. And you, sir? Frank Adams. And your rank? Private. <laughs> I said, said your rank? No class. Oh, uh, I see. Well, Private Adams, this is Sergeant McDevitt. We've met. Good. Well, I'm going to ask you... <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Private Adams, to assist me in putting the sergeant into that small, uncomfortable-looking box over there. Do you think you can do it? I'll force myself. <laughs> While the sergeant is stepping in, Private Adams, will you test the box to see if there are any secret panels? Yes, just test it. Uh, you, uh... Did that knocking very professionally, Private Adams, in civilian life. Were you a magician's assistant? No, hotel detective. I see. Well, Sergeant, before we close the lid on you, I want to explain the trick. On the count of ten, you will have vanished from this box, and in your place, there will appear a beautiful woman. Very well, now. You crawl down, Sergeant. We close the lid, and you count to ten. One, two, three. While the Sergeant is counting to ten, I'd like everybody to watch me very closely. I take this magic prayer paper... And whoosh, whoosh, I touch a match to it, and who have we here but that luscious starlet from Universal Pictures, Miss Lois Collier. <laughs> these, these magic uh, prayer papers are a dollar apiece. They're agents in all aisles of the theater. <laughs> Excuse me, Orson. I'm sorry if I'm a little late. I had to pass those sentries again. Oh, yes. Yeah. Those sentries are really doing their job. When we arrived at the gate this afternoon, the uh, sentries took no chances. The microphone's a little high for you, dear, and I'd have to get down on my knees. To play with they, they let me right in, but they searched Lois for two hours. I, uh, they, they searched so long they forgot what they were looking for. <laughs> I'd like to explain this trick to you. There's a sergeant in this box who's just counted to ten and disappeared. Look, I open the lid. We'll we'll come back to that later. You know, Austin, I've always wanted to entertain servicemen. Uh I thought of envy a performer like yourself. You do a big magic show for them, but well, it's different with me. What have I got to offer these boys? Well, no coaching from the audience, please. Uh, Private Adams, I'm going to need your cooperation this time. I'm going to ask you to put your arm uh, around Miss Collier. Do you think you can do it? I'll force myself. (laughs) All right, wait a minute, soldier. You just put your arm around her, you know. She's an actress, not an infiltration court. (laughs) Maybe I better explain this trick so you know what you're doing. Mm, He knows what he's doing. Well, now, when Private Adams counts three, the young lady will vanish for your very eyes and appear in this box, from which Sergeant Collins has just disappeared. As you can plainly see, I opened the lid. And one. <laughs> Sorry, Lois, it doesn't seem to be working out quite on schedule. Uh, maybe I'd better throw myself into a trance. I close my eyes. I'm drifting, 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 miles above the earth, high, high up above the clouds, high, high, high. Pilot to tower, coming in for a landing. <laughs> What's that, Donovan? Oh, sure, 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 sure. And presto, I open the lid. I open the lid. Now Lois Collier's in the box. That's half the trick, Sergeant. You're supposed to have vanished. Sure, 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 sure. The original Miss Five by Five, one of the great blues singers, Miss Helen Andrews, and our all-star combination of jazz players in blues in E flat. Here's some bad news for the actress. Wednesday, May the 24th, Torrance, California. Here today at the Flying Red Horse Refinery, another TCC unit went on stream. This is the second of two double refining units built by the makers of Mobile Gas, 
And now devoted exclusively to the production of aviation gasoline for war. Friends, those new TCC refining units, part of the world's greatest catalytic cracking development, are now turning out vast quantities of aviation gasoline. This is the gasoline with flying horsepower. An amazing new super fuel whose power ingredients enable our warplanes to take off quicker, fly faster, and carry our heavy bomb loads than ever before. The Army and Navy said to the men of Torrance Refinery, we expect you to produce more than 900,000 barrels of aviation fuel components during the next few months. Can you do it? The refiners answered, you bet. That's a lot of gasoline, but you'll get it, and maybe more. Yes, we know our air forces will not lack the power to fight and win while men like those at Torrance are on the job. And after victory, their skill will mean new and better gasolines for American motorists when flying horsepower comes to mobile gas at the sign of the flying red horse. Half a century ago, there was a Dr. Hyde who was a missionary in the South Seas and who's remembered today because he wrote a public letter to a reverend brother of his, a certain Dr. Gage. In this letter, Dr. Hyde attacked the character and memory of a Catholic priest who had died two years before in the leper colony of Molokai. This priest, Dr. Hyde declared, was dirty, coarse, headstrong and bigoted, and not pure in his personal life. Now, this priest, whom Dr. Hyde called dirty and impure, was none other than the martyr, Father Damien, whose selfless devotion to his island parish was climaxed on that Sunday morning in 1885 when he commenced his sermon not with the accustomed words, My brethren, but with a terrible and heart-rending address, We lepers. Dr. Hyde's letter was printed in a Sydney newspaper, and that miserable cleric may well have regretted to his dying day that it was ever noticed by the literary gentleman whose answer I'm going to read to you now. Sydney, February 25th, 1890, to the Reverend Dr. C.M. Hyde, Beritania Street, Honolulu, sir. You may remember that you have done me several courtesies, for which I am prepared to be grateful, but there are duties which come before gratitude and offenses which justly divide friends. Your letter to the Reverend H.B. Gage is a document which in my sight, if you had filled me with bread when I was starving, if you had sat up to nurse my father when he lay a-dying, would yet absolve me from the bonds of gratitude. You belong, sir, to a sect, I believe my sect, which has enjoyed and partly failed to utilize an exceptional advantage in the islands of Hawaii. This is not the place to enter into the degree or causes of their failure, but this much must be plainly dealt with. In the course of their calling, the missionaries, or too many of them, grew rich. It may be news to you that the houses of missionaries are a cause of mocking on the streets of Honolulu. It will at least be news to you that when I returned your civil visit, the driver of my cab commented on the size, the taste, and the comfort of your home on Beritania Street. No, your sect, and remember, as far as any sect avows me, it is mine, has not done ill in a worldly sense in the Hawaiian kingdom. When calamity befell their innocent parishioners, when leprosy descended and took root in the islands, to that prosperous mission and to you as one of its adornments, God sent at last an opportunity. I know that others of your colleagues look back on the inertia of your church and the intrusion and decisive heroism of Damien with something almost to be called remorse. I'm sure it is so with yourself. I'm persuaded your letter was inspired by a certain envy. But, sir, when we have failed and another has succeeded, when we have stood by and another has stepped in, when we sit and grow bulky in our charming mansions and a plain, uncouth peasant steps into the battle under the eyes of God and succors the afflicted and consoles the dying and is himself afflicted in his turn and dies upon the field of honor... The battle cannot be retrieved. It is a lost battle, and lost forever. Your church and Damien's were in Hawaii upon a rivalry to do well. You having in one huge instance failed and Damien succeeded, I marvel it should not have occurred to you that you were doomed to silence. That when you had been outstripped in that high rivalry and sat inglorious in the midst of your well-being, in your pleasant rooms, and Damien crowned with glories and horrors, toiled and rotted in that pigsty of his under the cliffs of Kalawau, you, the elect who would not, 
were the last man on earth to collect and propagate gossip on the volunteer who would and did. I think I see you, for I try to see you in the flesh as I write these sentences. I think I see you leap at the word pigsty. He was a coarse, dirty man. These were your own words. And you may think I am come to support you with fresh evidence. In a sense, it is even so. Damien has been too much depicted with a conventional halo. Such information as I have, I gathered on the spot from those who knew him well and long, who beheld him with no halo. These gave me what knowledge I possess, and I learned it in the place itself, Kalawao, which you've never visited. You, I imagine, to be one of those persons who talk with cheerfulness of that place which oxen and wain ropes could not drag you to behold. You who do not even know its situation on the map probably denounce sensational descriptions, stretching your limbs the while in your pleasant parlor on Baratania Street. When I was pulled ashore there one early morning, there sat with me in the boat two sisters bidding farewell in humble imitation of Damien to the lights and joys of human life. One of these wept silently. I could not withhold myself from joining her. Had you been there, nature would have triumphed even in you. And as the boat drew nearer and you beheld the stairs, crowded with abominable defamations of our common manhood, and you saw yourself landing in the midst of such a population as only now and then surrounds us in the horror of a nightmare, what a haggard eye you would have rolled over your reluctant shoulder toward the house on Baratania Street. Had you gone on, had you found every fourth face a blot upon the landscape? Had you visited the hospital and seen the butt ends of human beings lying there, almost unrecognizable, but still breathing, still thinking, still remembering, you would have understood that life in the lazaretto is an ordeal from which the nerves of a man's spirit shrink, even as his eye quails under the brightness of the sun. You would have felt it was, even today, a pitiful place to visit and a hell to dwell in. And observe that which I saw and suffered was from a settlement purged, bettered, beautified. It was a different place when Damien came there and made his great renunciation and slept that first night under a tree amidst his rotting brethren, alone with pestilence and looking forward with what courage, with what pitiful shrinkings of dread, God only knows, to a lifetime of dressing sores and stumps. You say that Damien was caught it's very possible you make us sorry for the lepers who had only a coarse old peasant for their friend and father. Damien was dirty, you say. Think of the poor lepers annoyed with this dirty comrade. Damien was headstrong. I believe you're right again, and I thank God for his strong head and heart. Damien was not sent to Molokai, but went there without orders. I have heard Christ in the pulpits of our church held up for imitation on the ground that his sacrifice was voluntary. Damien had no hand in the reforms, you say. If ever man brought reforms and died to bring them, it was he. There's not a clean cup or towel in the bishop home. But dirty Damien washed it. Damien, you say, was impure in his personal life. How do you know that? Is this the nature of the conversation in the house on Beratania Street? Which the Camber envied driving past, racy details of the misconduct of the poor peasant priest toiling under the cliffs of Molokai. When I was there, I heard complaints of Damien. Why was this never mentioned? True, I'd heard it once before. I must tell you how. There came to Samoa from Honolulu, one who in a public house on the beach volunteered that Damien had been guilty of misconduct and had sickened from having contact with lepers. The man sprang to his feet. I'm not at liberty to give his name. But from what I heard, I doubt if you would care to have him to dinner in Baratania Street. You miserable little, here's a word I dare not print. It would so shock your ears. If the story were a thousand times true, he cried, can't you see you're a million times lower for daring to repeat it? Reverend sir, I'll suppose your story to be true. I will suppose, and God forgive me for supposing but Damien faltered and stumbled in his narrow path of duty. I'll suppose that in the horror of his isolation, perhaps in the fever of disease, he, who was doing so much more than he had sworn, failed in the letter of his priestly oath. He, who was so much a better man than either you or me, who did what we would never dreamed of daring, he too 
tasted our common frailty. Oh, the pity of it. The least tender should be moved to tears. The most incredulous to prayer. And all that you could do was to pen your letter to the Reverend H.B. Gage. Is it drawing it all clear to you what a picture you've drawn of your heart? You had a father. Suppose this tale were about him and some informant brought it to you. Proof in hand. I'm not making too high an estimate of your emotional nature when I suppose you would regret the circumstance. That you would feel the tale of frailty the more keenly since it changed the author of your days. And that the last thing you would do would be to publish it in the religious press. Well, the man who tried to do what Damien did is my father. And the father of the man in the public bar. And the father of all who love goodness. And he was your father, too. If God had given you the grace to see it. Signed. Robert Louis Stevenson. Thank you to Mobile Gas and Mobile Oil. Invite you to listen next week. Same time, same station to Austin Wells. Mr. Wells' guest is Lynn Barry. Lois Collier appears to the courtesy of Universal Studios, whose current release is This is the Life. Lee and Lynn Wilde appears through the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor, producers of the White Clips of Dover. John McIntyre speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.